Firstly, thank you so much for my distinguished panel. Thank you. So, I need to give you all a free gift. Thank you all for being a sport or a sport. Let's go over to the red dot. Okay. Hey, you all feel very distant. You all want to come in front and sit on the floor or not? Hello? Cheng Long, hey Chiyon, y'all feel very distant, y'all want to sit on the floor here. It's like we have a river in between us. Okay. Okay, so before we start, thank you everyone for coming today. So this is what we call the Ruby Christmas party. Trying to keep it like, you know, a norm for the coming years as well. So thank you firstly to Tinderbox for sponsoring the space. So can we give Tinderbox a round of applause? you might not know what Tinkerbox is about, so maybe Ted, you want to talk about what you all do? Tinkerbox, like give a 30 seconds pitch on what you guys do. Right, so Tinkerbox is a uh, Ruby on Rails studio, we build uh, web apps in Rails obviously, and also some mobile apps mostly <coughs> for startups. Uh, and we also play a lot of games like table tennis and <laughs> uh, so. And also, we are always hiring, so if you're looking for a job, then you do Ruby on Rails. And apply tonight. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then for those people come in, sit on the floor here. Come, come, Chetan, come, sit here. I'll just stand No, no, sit here. <laughs> Your boss is talking, you need to sit here. <laughs> okay, sit down there, okay, okay. So, uh, and of course, I'm sure, are you enjoying the food in your hands? What, yes or no? Are you enjoying the food in your hand? Yes. yes! Okay, so the food is proudly sponsored by Referral Candy. Okay, round of applause. Do you want to talk about Referral Candy? Sure, so we are um, a software startup based in Singapore. We build uh, a software app that runs the customer referral program for online stores. So you may know uh, Dropbox or Uber, how you tell a friend and you get free ride or free space. We do that same thing for SME online stores around the world. Uh, most of our customers are in the US, um, over a thousand customers using us. Some of the bigger ones are Uniqlo, Tommy Hilfiger, Rebox run a campaign uh, with us, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, so a lot of companies around the world. We're headquartered in Singapore, uh, also looking for engineers and talented devs all the time, so apply tonight as well. We <laughs> <laughs> feel inclined. For 20% pay increment, apply tonight. <laughs> okay, and of course, the food is also sponsored by Hyatt.com. Uh, I don't think any of them is here today, uh, but if you know about Hyatt.com, it's like uh, they would help you get hired. So if you, if you think that you have good skills, they would actually help to market you to you know, big companies like Facebook. So they did this in the US, right? Like Facebook, uh, Google, etc. So they would put up your profile, uh, you know, they would like auction you to them and you would actually get competing offers and you can see you know, which one would treat you better and sort of accept that offer. So, so far it's been pretty good uh, you know, take up rate in the US and they have been able to place people in these good companies uh, with very high pay. So they'll be coming into Singapore very soon. Um, in fact, they've already started their operations, and so today they have also, you know, <coughs> sponsored the food and dreams over here. Uh, and at the same time, uh, yeah, Jolly Good Co also forked out a little bit of money to pay for the drinks. So enjoy the food and drinks. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, so today we are not only doing like the Christmas party where we go around, you know, and talk. Uh, I want to do something different. Uh, especially we have a lot of local rubies here um, who don't really have a chance to speak, sometimes they are too shy to talk, um, they might not have a topic to talk about, so I decided to invite some of them here today who have been doing you know, Ruby or been in a Ruby startup for a while to actually come and talk about the experience with Ruby. So it's something different, something that you know, we are doing it for the first time, hopefully not the last. Uh, hopefully we can even do this for Red Dot Ruby Conf because it's my wish to you know, bring all of you to the international stage as well. <laughs> So, like managers, right? Talent, talent managers. <laughs> Alright, so today it's sort of like a beta MVP we try out and see <laughs> how do these people respond to difficult questions. Alright, so um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to start the panel session. I'm going to kick off, right, and ask them some questions. Later on, I might 
I will even open up the floor so that you can ask them your difficult questions as well. So uh, let me first introduce my panelists. Firstly, we have Ryan from Grab Taxi. Okay. We have Sam from Flow Hero. We have Jeanette from Rivero Candy. And we have Michael Chen from Neo. So that was a very simple introduction. I actually want to let them talk a little bit more about what they do, you know, daily, how do they use Ruby at work, etc. So why don't we start with Ryan? Hi, uh, so my name is Ryan. Uh, <coughs> I used to lead the Ruby on Rust team at Grab Taxi, but nowadays I do more of an uh, engineering manager kind of role. Uh, Grab Taxi uses Ruby on Rust for a lot of stuff, like, you know, if you ever use our app, the passenger the, the passenger app, it actually talks to a Ruby on Rust backend on behind the scenes. And yeah, that is how we use Ruby on Rust. Okay. Sam? Right, so uh, well today I run Flow Hero and Flow Hero is a consulting and also a product app uh, that is actually JSON based uh, uh, workflow engine and it's written in Ruby on Rust. I uh, find it easy to, to build the entire app uh, with that and uh, with Rails 5 coming out, probably hop on that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, previously, I also used Ruby to do insane stuff. Uh, prototyping like massive file imports, database imports of gigabytes. Shouldn't do that, but it's good because it's elegant, very easy to like prototype and build everything. Then you refactor and you make it efficient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Dinesh? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, uh, we do an SMB SaaS app based in Singapore. Um, we have almost 30 people on the team. We have a team in Singapore as well as the Philippines. Uh, one of our investors is a co-founder of Skype, and pretty much our entire stack is built on Ruby. Cool. No, 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 I'm talking about the aircon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's getting very hot here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the lights, uh, lights and nerves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, does it work? Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, Michael. So, uh, hi, my name is Michael. Uh, I'm an engineer at, uh, so I've been doing Ruby for the last two years. Um, basically, before that, I've been doing PHP. Uh, in fact, I started the PHP user group in Singapore. Um, in the last two years, I've been doing PHP professionally on a daily basis. Um, I find Ruby to be very awesome, as in it's very, very different from PHP. Um, and I think I can do a lot more things. I mean, it's more efficient in doing getting things done. Uh, in some of the more bigger scale stuff, like production stuff, it's easy to get it done. Like say a login form or something, just you download a gem and you're done, right? So um, stuff like that you can't really get out of the box easily with, with PHP. <laughs> For me, that's I think the biggest uh, advantage. Uh, so. Okay. Okay. So next question, right? Uh, I guess more to the business owners who have who are doing their startups in Ruby. So why do you decide to pick Ruby in the first place to you know build your company on? Why not PHP or you know Java JavaScript? Sure, so I mean in our case it happened to be that just um, it was something that I or the, the founders were familiar with. Uh, so we knew Ruby better than Python and that was pretty much the other alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point you know Rails was coming out um, and had been out for a while. Uh, there was quite a big ecosystem in Ruby, a lot of gems that let you kind of develop quickly. So that's kind of So how long was that ago? Five years? So I guess we, uh, yeah, about four to five years, or a bit more than that, is when we, we kind of decided to kind of build this on Ruby and use that as a language. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about Sam? Why, why do you pick Ruby? Right. Uh, from the direction, definitely one. Okay. Um, but also because Ruby already is more like um, convention over configuration. Mm. So a lot of things like kind of set in the pattern. If, if the pattern suits your app, then you should use it. And then you don't have to think too much, you know, mm. like um, the Ruby gems are great. And also, of course, because of all the real gems is designed with the convention in mind, it just plug and play and pretty much you know, in. And it, it helps it helps to um, um, offload that, 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 that MVC architecture to DHH. Oh, okay. And then you do your own business stuff. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So this question, um, like maybe maybe even Ryan can answer it. So I've heard that you know, as a I'm a consultant as well. So as a consultant, sometimes clients come to me to say, oh, I want to do my app in Ruby, because 
uh, investors tell me it's going to get a higher valuation <laughs> if, if you know I decide to sell my app. Is this true? Do you all, have you all heard of such things about talking to investors you know, that Ruby is going to yield a better valuation versus other kinds of programming languages? Any? Uh, I, my, my personal opinion on that is that I, I, I don't think it matters that much is because investors ultimately just look at your financials. They don't actually look at what stack you use. Mm -hmm. So if you tell them they use Ruby on your say, okay, it might, it, might, it might be easier for you to kickstart the whole thing, but mm -hmm. other than that, it doesn't really matter too much. Okay. Any experience? I think typically investors don't really care. Um, okay. The more technical ones might inquire and have an opinion about it, but it's, you know, if anything, they're, they're thinking less on the technical standpoint. It's more of, can you hire developers for it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, say you did get acquired, they would have to uh, kind of integrate your stack into their stack. There might be a consideration there, but mm -hmm. ultimately it's not kind of a, a major thing that they look at. So you mentioned about hiring. So has it been difficult? Like, do you ever regret being on the Ruby you know, language because is it easier to hire, more difficult to hire, or quality is worse, you know? Or I, your, I mean, I opinion? guess on our end, uh, hiring is always, you know, there's always a talent that you're looking for, so that's always a, something that you have to be constantly doing. Mm -hmm. But I would say Ruby in general gives you a better shot at getting someone than say if you're using Haskell or, or something more arcane, uh, which you do meet some startups use, right. and that has pros and cons, right? So Haskell, it might be a lot harder to hire the devs, but probably anybody you find is going to be appropriate and mm -hmm. skilled enough to do what you need. Um, so I think hiring is, is definitely uh, something you consider, and it's, it's, it's doable, right, with, with Ruby as a language, and it's, you know, again, so Ruby is no longer the, the hot new thing, mm -hmm. so it, it's more mainstream people apply. So that's so fine, you, you just have to make sure you're selecting right. Do you find the same problem? Because Grab Taxi uses a lot of different languages, right? Yeah. iOS, Android, Go, mm -hmm. so Ruby. Uh, so Grab Taxi's experience there is that it actually has been pretty hard to hire Ruby on Rust developers, especially since like we, we first started off in Malaysia and Ruby on Rust is not a mainstream language there, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like most of the students would know uh, C Sharp, ASP.NET and stuff like that. So it actually has been pretty hard to hire Ruby on Rust developers because it is not the coolest thing, mm. nor is it the most common thing. Okay. So we are sort of like in between. Mm. So that means you had better hit rates for iOS, Android, Go. Is it I, higher I would say this? yes. Yeah. Ah, it's okay. easier for us to hire this. Interesting. Any comments from, do you all have any experience in that? Um, for me, it's more like, when, whenever I get a, a, a Ruby and Rails uh, developer resume, right. um, I could question him in, in, in jQuery okay. uh, because it comes with a stack. Uh, probably now I could question them in, in CoffeeScript, uh, maybe Postgres a little bit here and there, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't have to stumble explaining what's VC. Mm -hmm. If I try the, a little bit more of the uh, conventional stacks like um, on, say, Java.net, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, you get a lot of work resumes. But when you ask them a little bit more about CSS selectors, uh, no, like right. those. Then <laughs> I'm not talking about the entire. I'm not generalizing, mm -hmm. but, but that's what I got with my resume so far. Okay. So uh, because of the volume, is a numbers game. So maybe like um, to pick up the good ones, maybe that's 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 only uh, not too many. But with Rails, because the number of resumes are so few, mm. right? And because uh, the uh, the stack already has in so many components, pretty fine. Mm. They they usually know. Mm. Um, they they may not be very very proficient, but they can do it. Mm. Yeah. So um, that's a good thing. So whenever I get a Rails resume, I I, I don't have to um, uh, uh, really test everything. All I need to do is let's do a parent interview. That's so so does that mean that generally across the board, if you get Resumes from people who know Ruby or Rails generally they are better developers. Was that what, how I interpret it? <laughs> yeah. There's a difference between knowing the entire stack and oh, all okay. the layers okay, and, okay. and being very good in a certain language. Oh, right? Okay, so, okay. Uh, um, you know, in, in the old days, you have like C and C. Right. So, you can have this rocket scientist who can write really, really good array parsers. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't write maybe an enterprise app because he doesn't know the pattern very well. Mm. So what, what Rails gives you is that it gives you a very good pattern you know, to solve most of your problems and everything. Mm -hmm. So you don't um, necessarily need a very uh, rocket scientist kind of a developer. Right. You can actually have a younger guy and then you can mold him and train him in all the advanced stuff. Mm -hmm. But he knows the pattern well already. So okay. yeah, that's the, kind of the advantage. Okay. Yeah. What, what, what do you all think? Like, 
Yeah. I mean, relative to who? Relative yeah. to which developers? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think the, the people in this room itself are kind of a self-selected group, mm -hmm. right? So I don't think that, you know, maybe relative to the average Singaporean, you know, the average mm -hmm. engineer yeah. you yeah. find in Singapore yeah. who, you know, just studies computer science because it's, it's a job and maybe joins a bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then I think you are going to find, mm -hmm. um, you know, good Ruby, yeah. uh, develop, Ruby developers are going to be kind of above average. Okay. But among our crowd, I'd say it's about uh, about average. Right? Mm -hmm. Anybody who's here would be okay. kind of above the cut. Awesome, thank you. So, so we know that Grab Taxi has been, you know, like super growth, unicorn. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Ruby contributed to that? Or actually it stopped you all from being, growing even faster? I, I actually think Ruby contributed a lot to helping Grab Taxi grow. <laughs> <laughs> Like what one of these guys just said, like it it force it sort of it focuses more on convention and getting the work done instead of having debates like do I use camera case or do I use dash case and stuff mm. like that. It just tells you you're gonna do this and that's all you're gonna do. You're not gonna go away from this, mm. which which then allows the engineers to sort of focus on the problem itself and not not stray too far away and thinking about all the all the cases or the like just all the conventions that you are supposed to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so on that, right, this is nothing trollish, but maybe to Michael, because now you, you talk a little bit about <laughs> difference to PHP, yeah. you want to elaborate on that. So right now, like for example, if you want to start a new project, right. would you use PHP <coughs> or would you use Ruby? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really yeah, not trolling it. Right. Right. No. <laughs> <Maybe, try> <laughs> Um, personally, I would use because I right now the, the language is closer to me, mm -hmm. as in in terms of my day to day interaction with it is Ruby on Rails, mm -hmm. Ruby and Ruby on Rails. So I guess if I would have to work on any new project of my own mm -hmm. capacity, I'll probably be using Rails, okay. um, which I've done actually in another in like two of the smaller personal projects I've done it before. It's like you, you, it's kind of like a weekend thing, uh, weeknights kind of kind of hack. Going to put together very quickly. Mm. Uh, I think Ruby on Rails is actually very quick for prototyping. Again, the getting the, the basic MVP out very quickly. Um, for example, the the PHP con uh, website. I actually have a ticketing system which I actually wrote in Ruby on Rails. Mm. Um, for PHP yeah. con. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason with Mexico is is so it's all the tools are there and it's very easy to, to prototype with something quickly. Mm. And for me to go back to learn something like Laravel or some of the other PHP frameworks which have progressed very much since uh, I last touched it like two years back. So for me it was, uh, it was a practical thing because it's, if I need to take some time to relearn all the Laravel uh, framework and all kick PHP framework conventions, it's going to be very difficult. Or rather it's going to take time and I think that's something I didn't, don't want to do as a if it's going to be a side project or something I work on weekends or weeknights, um, really want to be productive. And I think using having something like Ruby on Rails, of, I mean, I'm not saying that you can't get the same kind of productivity on PHP. I'm sure you can, right? If you're somebody who has been using Laravel or KPHP for a while, which I had in the past, I could actually put together something very quickly in the weekend. But then again, I was young. <laughs> I was much younger. Uh, but nowadays, I'm just want to focus on my, my time is precious. I just want to focus on getting productive and getting a concept out, mm. right? Just to get something out there and get 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 some traction or get some um, feedback from mm. people who are actually who might be one user. Like for example, when I work on the ticketing app, I roll it out very quickly. Where I found a bug, uh, and when it went live, there was a bug, and I was able to like fix it in, in very very quickly, just following the. Uh, the, the, the locks, uh, the telling the locks on the Heroku, I was able to find out, oh right, because there's a problem with this particular object or that's being passed in and stuff like that. I was able to debug it very quickly, which is something you can't really get out from, from PHP up until recently, only, only until recently that PHP introduced like a debugger mm -hmm. that you can just plug into your, to your code very easily. Uh, they had like PHP, they had, they had X debug before, but it wasn't as good. It's nothing to the level of tooling that you have in, in Ruby on Rails or Ruby uh, as overall. So I think, um, yeah, so okay. uh, Ruby on Rails is pretty much by choice if I do something right now, mm -hmm. just like uh, start from scratch, for example. Okay, thank you. So before I continue to ask more questions, I want to open up the floor now. So you all have a chance to ask them any questions about Ruby or non-Ruby, about the company as well, <laughs> about Grab Taxi. <laughs> 
Use the right gems. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But usually the people actually look inside a gem and they just deploy it. We can. Well, we can. Do you all look inside the gem? Uh, occasionally uh, we do. Mm. Because sometimes the documentation of some gems are just not very well mm. done. Yeah. So you just need to look at the code yep. and see yep. how it's done. For example, I was using Active Merchant, right? Uh, I was using Active Merchant for e commerce. Uh -huh. And the documentation for uh, Stripe was very sparse. Oh. Right, so I had to like, look at the code. All oh, right, this is how this is done. This is what is for how being classed in and stuff like that. So I guess you can. The good thing about being, being open source, you just open it up, look at the code. If there's a bug, you know there's a bug, which I found. I found a bug actually <laughs> on that uh, on active, active Merchant. I actually found a pull request, and they actually, it was uh, eventually merged in the main branch. So being uh, open source has its benefits, as in we can. We see a bug, we, we see that the code, we can make uh, make a fix and we can submit the fix, which is which will then, you know, everyone will benefit from that fix. Yeah, I think looking inside the library is pretty common, um, especially if you're using it and you see kind of behavior that's not expected. Uh, for maybe the smaller libraries, like the more well-known ones are usually pretty uh, well controlled, uh, but maybe the smaller ones, if you're using something, it's quite normal to look in there again. Like Michael mentioned, because it's open source, it makes it much easier. And again, the Ruby community is pretty open to things like pull requests and fixing it and answering questions if you have, so that helps. Even oh. even if those doesn't work out for you, you can actually debug the debug yeah. the underlying gem that you're using. It's actually very easy to do in Rust. Why didn't solve the problem before? Sorry? The bug that you found um, in the oh. X It was... The bug, <laughs> bug, I mean, because bug, they yeah. didn't run the... PhD conference. <laughs> 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 no, they find the bug. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, um, the, it wasn't actually a bug. It was more like a flag, which was in Stripe. You can actually pass a flag at the which would which would trigger an email received to be sent to the payer. Um, and I tried to pass a flag into the options object, uh, the hash. But apparently it wasn't. It was that option was dropped. I said it's not accepted. It's not passed on to the to the request, which I found was a bit strange. Because I would think that sending an email receipt would be a usual use case for uh, for an e-commerce thing. Um, so apparently they didn't think about it. Or rather, there's no one worked on that particular bit. So it could be a new flag. I don't know. Um, for whatever reason, it was never there. Because that gem, particular gem that I won't use, Active Merchant, is actually pretty big. Uh, so that there are many different components and it's like one library that supports PayPal, Braintree, Stripe and so many others. So yeah, it's a fairly, it's fairly huge library. Um, yeah. uh, so I look into gems all the time, that's one of my evaluation criteria for using the open source libraries, right? Check that you know it doesn't have a lot of issues, check that it doesn't have a lot of open pool requests, check that the commit is pretty recent, check that uh, you know there are specs for the open source library and also go in, take a look, a rough look of what is it before you decide to use it or not. Sometimes the gem could just contain 50 lines that right. you might, it might be better for you to just code it yourself and put it in your <laughs> code rather than yeah. use the gem. Yeah. I would recommend checking out like Ruby Toolbox. Yep. Ruby Toolbox uh, is a website which, sh which shows you a listing of all the different gems and it can sort them by categories. So a particular category of gems like say a login or logging or whichever stuff can you tell you, they will show you the gems that are in the same category and tell you how how recent was their last commit, how many how many bugs was, was filed, uh, how many pull requests was there, the number of issues. Can, it gives you a very good it's a very good tool for evaluating gems. And and if the uh, the gem has a GitHub repository, you can check out whether they have Travis, right, CI, so that at least they are running their tests, it's still green and not red and or amber or something else. Uh, and also like uh, Winston say when it was the last commit. Although last commit sometimes can be deceiving, but uh, because, because I, I do some of I use some of the uh, Ruby gems that are actually wrappers for C plus plus libraries, mm -hmm. and and they are like maybe like five hundred developers around the world using it only. Mm -hmm. So it's probably like last two years and then nobody touches it, right? So uh, but if you're doing all the popular stuff, it should be well maintained and everything. So um, looking at the code, uh, like what uh, Michael says, uh, for me because I, I know the C plus library very well. I know all the params on command line. I would 
ask myself, should this option be in the hash that I pass in through the uh, wrapper gem? So, and I look into the code to see whether do they just pass whatever I pass into the gem to the library, or do they do exclude or accept or whatever else? So, um, yeah, if they do, then I will just pull request and put it in. Yeah. Okay. What is your benchmark for too many pull requests? Uh, <laughs> depends on the gem. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it depends on whether they actually answer the pull request or not as well. You know, whether it's just stale, as in nobody cares, and then they are always trying to ping, you know, where's the maintainer, where's the maintainer, or, or, or rather, it's like people try to make pull requests and the author is trying to answer them and it's just not moving because of differing views and opinions. So like Rails, right? Obviously, people want to make a lot of pull requests, but there's always differing views and how the core team wants to work versus the number of people who wants to make, you know, commits the code. So there's a balance, lah. I don't think there's a hard number. Say. And, and I suggest looking at the branches because they may have accepted pull requests in a certain branch but not master. Mm. So they, they, they could have like branched out the code, clone, clone the entire repository, right, in a way, and then try out the pull request and say, yeah, it's not quite what we want, right? That's why they didn't allow that on, on master. Yeah. Question? Yes. Uh, this is my question, but um, you mentioned very interested to know why about, I guess, your failures, and either architecturally or an idea that you thought would be right but didn't work, and you know, how you look back at it, is it still a factory today, yeah. and how you dealt with that? Mm. Awesome question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass it on to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> no failures. I need to think about it. Uh, so I'm no longer part of our engineering team, but they have to, <laughs> they have to live with some of my um, <laughs> wrong choices. I guess uh, one of the top ones right now would be uh, we take data mapper. Uh, oh, uh, okay. yeah. So we'll we'll move to Active Record at, at some point. The reason we picked it initially was um, you know at that point they were kind of about the same stage, right? Mm -hmm. At the same stage. Data mapper was more SQL agnostic, so we were looking at some kind of really no SQL databases. Uh, but I mean, I guess the way to think about these things is, you, if you look back on it and like, why do you choose this part versus that part? You'll be beating yourself up over many, many things, not just a language or a library choice, right? You have to think about it in terms of where you were at that point, where you have 10 parts in front of you, and you know all the right choices you make, right? Is is what matters at the end of the day. And just make sure you, you know, make decisions in a way that you can fail gracefully. So don't try to not make mistakes. Try to make decisions where even if the decision turned out to be suboptimal, your startup isn't gonna like die, right? Or you aren't gonna not be able to uh, find developers to improve it. So it helps to think about it that way, I guess. Is it a really is it a Rails four app or Rails three or so right now we're on three point two three okay but it's some prompting ah. <laughs> so um, for me it's not really um, failure it's just not efficient code uh, let me let me share with you uh, I wrote a massive database uh, importer like many years back mm. and the reason why I started with Ruby because I wanted to access on back reels, I, I, I really as a rate task and then uh, it has to access the models. So I don't insert those lines um, every row into the model. And because the uh, source data is junk, I have to like use a really good parser, right? A really good parser that's not in existence. So I chose Ruby because it's fast. I can do regex, I can do all sorts of stuff on the strings and I insert them. Um, but years later then I figure out that there's actually a better way to do it. Yeah. So. Uh, could I have done it earlier on with a different uh, method that is more down to C or more down to Postgres direct? Uh, I could have, but uh, it, will, it will be harder to debug because I took like one and a half months to debug that parcel alone because the source data is really junk. So um, if you run something that's really low level where you cannot debug, you cannot pull up the debugger and inspect and everything is really, really tough. Um, it, it, it's more efficient, but then you will never finish the code and then it's it's not going to help you in your work. Uh, I'd rather get it done. It can be slow. It could take like two hours to run, but it's there. You can debug it and everything. 
and then knowing the logic with those specs, with those R specs, now you could reconstruct the whole program in a separate language or a different language that's more efficient. Yeah. Michael? Um, as Dinesh said, we don't be afraid of making mistakes. I think we work with a we work with an understanding that we with the knowledge that we have at the point where we implement the code. We the knowledge that we have right now at the point we wrote the code, we think is the best that we can do. And based on what we know and what we think the client wants, we build that piece of code uh, for the client uh, or for, for, your, for your company. So I think we take that approach as best, 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 best effort in getting things done. I think it, when we build things iteratively, we have always have opportunity to go back and refactor. Right? Um, I guess everyone should take it a point to write tests for your code so that you can run, when you go back and make, do some refactoring, it will be much easier for you to do that. Right? Um, um, I will even go as far as thinking about you know, feature tests as well. You know, like if you build a web application, feature tests on top of unit tests, um, which would make it easier for you to look at behavior of the, of the code. Um, because to be honest, when you, when you work on the code uh, at the, for the very beginning, you won't know how it will scale, or how you will use it. Like I wrote um, for a client of, of ours, we wrote a, the REST API. Uh, we, we tested it with the test data that we had. Uh, it ran very smoothly, there was no problem with the migration, the data, all that stuff. But when you try to load it up a snapshot of the production data, that's where we found some bottlenecks. Right? So it's only when you look at, when you actually test it with production data that you realize, oh, wait, we should, we should actually done it this way, we should have done it that way. Because you really want to know until you actually test it with actual production yeah. code, yeah. right? And in that particular situation, it wasn't the fault of Ruby, it was just I was meeting some index. <laughs> in the database, right? So you could you may not even the problem may not even be in your code. It may have to be out somewhere else. Like in that case, it was, it was just that I was doing a full table scan on a on table which didn't have that particular index that I needed for the columns that I had. So I think the indexes sped up the, the, the migration job much for uh, in like a factor of ten to hundred, which is amazing. So it's about doing your knowledge that you have now, build something uh, to get that out the door, get the client to accept the idea, or even accept the story. And then when you start having problems, um, take, a, take another look at it, right? I think, I think one thing to do really have uh, as test coverage is very important. Another thing is making sure that you write your code in a way that is easy to, to fix, it's easy to change things. Um, yeah, that's that the whole discussion all together, how to write code in the more maintainable manner, there's a whole other discussion. Okay, I, I always talk about a term called spaghetti code, which you, when you first prototype your app, you have this only one method class, and everything is inside. Um, now, but then you shouldn't go to the other extreme, like Java developers, where you orchestrate like 50, 200 methods in the class before you even write a single line of code. So Ruby allows you to kind of like write something, make it okay, refactor, refactor, refactor. With all the tests, you are very safe. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give one more example on, on that very quickly. Uh, it's, it's about the use of tools. Um, use the right tools uh, for the right tasks. That's number one. Number two, uh, when I was writing a, a little uh, background app that would scan all my HTTPS connections to ensure that the, 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 the signer of the certificate is not some government elsewhere in the world, um, I first prototyped the, the parser in, in RRB. Because it's fast, it's easy, I just fire up IRB and do my parser. And all that so once I get my regex correct, right, then I rewrote the whole thing in Node.js because I wanted to run it in Electron and you know, in the background stuff. So yeah, so that's how I, I kind of like switch between the two. Yeah. Okay, what about uh, right? So, so, yeah, so one of the biggest failures that I had was something, was that last year GrabTaxi actually attempted a major rewrite. We wanted to move a lot of our stuff into Rails instead of the whole Rails and Node.js architecture that we had at that time, mm. and then that that rewrite would require a lot. Would require a very, it requires a very high concurrency setup, and that is not something that Ruby is very good at. So that I would say, Rails is good for Ruby, or Rails is very good for a lot of stuff, but it's not good for high concurrency stuff. So and also, so when you when you consider what technology you want to use, think about the characteristics of that technology, and then decide on it. And also, don't take rewrites uh, lightly. 
like when someone tell you that we want to rewrite, rewrite something, think about it before you actually go and do it. So do you have to do the rewrite? Uh, it actually fell apart because it required oh. it required a lot of high concurrency I/O. So did y'all just stick with what you have, or you rewrite it in another language, or what uh, happened? So we we learned a lot from that attempt at rewriting from Node.js to to just Rails, okay. and then like about about six months further. From that point, six months down the line, we actually started rewriting parts of it in Go. Ah, okay. So now it's some of it is in Go right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have a failure to share. Uh, so I've been doing Ruby for eight years now. So in my first three years, I wrote code without writing tests. So some people is still maintaining my code. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm always writing tests now. Okay. I I know my mistakes. <laughs> so so please don't. Uh, please start to write tests. <laughs> Okay, do we have other questions? Yes. Um, and wisdom can be included in this question. <laughs> Could you each briefly describe like your favorite way to deploy a Ruby app to production? Yeah. Uh, favorite way to deploy Ruby app to production? Heroku. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Heroku. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the one second answer, Heroku. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's the simplest for now. I mean, for prototyping, fast prototyping, Deploy straight up to Heroku and then it works. Then case closed, move on. Next app. <laughs> technically it works, but for your wallet, I'm not quite sure, right? But, um, but technically it works very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it works a bit differently at like GrabTaxi uh, because our Rails stack is so complicated, like it connects to multiple databases and stuff like that. So we, we actually have Ansible scripts to handle a lot of our deployments. Mm. Right, right, right. What do you have for deployments? So we have a rate script that the actual team has written that I use. Oh, okay. uh, but yeah, if I was starting from scratch, I guess Heroku or um, Elastic Beanstalk. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I've used that a couple, and that gives you a bit more control, when, mm -hmm. especially yeah. if you need something customized. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I recommend that as well, uh, AWS Elastic Beanstalk. If you need more control, and more. Yeah. Right. I, I have apps on DigitalOcean. That's because Heroku wasn't able to support the app I was trying to run, so I deployed it on DigitalOcean. Uh, why didn't I use AWS? Because it just felt easier to deploy on DigitalOcean. So, so I'm still with DigitalOcean for that, for that app. But I'm using, for the database, I'm using RDS in uh, AWS. Interesting. Mm, yeah, because I don't want the database to be on that server, right? I mean, right. Does that make sense? Yeah. In the initial days though, you should, you should, initial days, right? You should ask yourself, uh, if my app cannot live in Heroku, why? Right, uh, there are some um, security uh, decision that Heroku guys made, and it's good for you. Yeah, but at the later stage, after like half a year, one year, when your, your app is mature, then maybe yeah, maybe you don't leave Heroku and all. Yeah, mm -hmm. but in initial days, three to six months, if 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 day one you cannot run in Heroku, something is really really wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. unless you're doing some rocket science. Well, I think for those of us who work in agencies, usually cost is a big thing, uh -huh. and so if you immediately go for easy to. But I thought agencies usually transfer the cost to the client, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no? You can always run in the free tier for just for testing, and when it goes live, just switch it, to, switch it on to, to one of the hobby tiers or higher tiers when it's ready to go live. Um, it's easy for, for prototyping and testing. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, one of the pain points that I feel when I use my digital ocean is right now, uh, like, Ruby is upgraded, and then mm -hmm. Ubuntu is upgraded, mm -hmm. right? I have to do it myself. Yep. I'm like, I don't have time, you know. Yep. Can, I, can someone help me do it? Or if I'm on Heroku, you know, these are all invisible to me. Yep. So it just works. So I don't care, you know. Otherwise, I might be facing a security, potential security problem, uh, which I think there was one with the... I can't remember what it was, but I had to patch it. Uh, passenger, right? I was using Passenger. So there was a bug with Passenger. I had to patch it on the uh, OS level instead of, you know, just letting someone handle it for me. When I do consulting, right, or when I work for somebody, um, depending on the budget level, which is like from zero to like $6,000 uh, for infrastructure, I, I recommend all sorts of stuff. And I, I recommend uh, even running on Mac Minis and all last time as well. And I, I still do, if you have like not much budget to run with. Um, but yeah, uh, Folks like Natchez IO and Heroku, they have done build packs that are really, really good for your apps. Yeah, they solve a lot of issues. So um, even if you're not going to use it, you should look at the build packs. How they how they configure the stacks. Yeah. Other questions? Maybe one or two more questions? Yes. So can real scale? Can real scale? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs>
Oh, oh, more specifically is uh, how much does the ser- the extra server cost, right? How how does it affect the bottom line? So maybe 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 the question. Okay, maybe you can tell us how many. Can you tell us how many servers you are using for real? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we are using about thirty servers for real. Three zero. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Three zero. Okay. And then. Uh, so it it it's not just a. Uh, it it doesn't just come down to the amount of money you're paying for your infrastructure. Mm. It also comes down to. How much time does the engineer need to spend to yep. learn this new language? How much time does the engineer need to spend to get a particular feature out? Whereas yep. when you do Rails, yeah, there are like 10,000 different gems out there. Whatever you're trying to do, you, it's very likely that the gem already exists. But in terms of, so do you think that, I'm sure Grab Taxi has a lot of traffic, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, do you think 30 servers right now is like, is it a buffer already for, you know, more traffic coming from I don't know, Indonesia or whatever. Or yeah. Uh, so, so Grab Taxi's traffic actually has a pattern, so you can sort of mm-hmm. estimate how much how much instances you want to prepare for. But thirty instances is definitely overscaling. Mm. We are we are we are just setting it more so that we can have a good holiday. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if if it works for Grab Taxi, it should work for your startup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this question is always asked, right? Uh, many many times, and you have to understand the nature of your app. It's, it's not to say that Ruby on Rails cannot scale. If you don't know your pattern of your app, the nature of the app, and then you write it in a different way, of course it's not going to scale very well. Um, uh, like, I, I don't represent Vicky anymore now, but Vicky uses layers and layers and layers and layers of cache because they know their app so well. They know it's more of like one guy contribute, a hundred guys reads it, a thousand guys reads it, right? So they cache it so well that, and, uh, that they provide CPU power for the contributors a lot of CPU power for contributors, but everybody else reads from layers of cache. So if one layer of cache is busted, it takes another layer of cache to reconstruct the first layer of cache. If the second layer is busted, it takes a third layer of cache, and so on and so forth. So if you do that, then the request never hits your controller. That's the bottom line. You don't want any request to hit your Postgres or your, con- or your application controller, right? So um, the things that come before it will help. Yeah, um, I'm not saying caching is like performance, but it's perceived performance, your users know. But, but if you're on an app where read and write is very important, that you need instantaneous read, write, broadcast, and everything, um, then you should really pick your, 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 your DB very well and, and, and scale your DB very well. Action cable runs on a bit of Redis, right? So uh, yeah, you should, you should you, you can tell, like, from why didn't they use Postgres? It's not that Postgres is not scalable. It's probably not the best DB for the job. Yeah. So what, what about Dinesh? Yes, so I would tend to agree. I think um, you know, the architecture for scalability is not so much a language or framework issue. It's very domain dependent. So what we do now at Refall Candy, it's a very different type of app. So you know, we, for us right now, in terms of scalability, I'd much rather just pay more and get uh, additional server. Because that's a minor cost compared to say uh, what we pay engineers and stuff. But I used to be at Garena, and that, there's no way you could build that in something like Rails for what we did. That has to be a C or C++ plus plus um, server that we build ourselves. Uh, so because the thing is, the, the traffic patterns are different. The way the, the service is used is different. So it's a very domain dependent kind of answer. Anything to add? Architecture, yeah. think about, you won't know where the bottleneck is until you actually get the users. Right? You can, you can architect it very well, but you have zero users. So. So look at <laughs> build something quickly, MVP, get it out of the door, yeah. um, get some users to you, to hit your app, and then from there you can tell where your behavior of your app should be. The kind of, kind of app that is, is it more CPU intensive? Is it more database rewrite intensive? Is it more I/O intensive or whatever? Finding out where the bottleneck is and then attack those bottlenecks, right? Um, yeah, I mean, like I wrote an app, I mean, I wrote an internal app recently, right? So, and then one of the bugs in Tribunal Tracker was the job, uh, the, the, the job to run it again would basically uh, time out and can't run it anymore, right? Like, what the hell is going on? It turns out that the job took, more, uh, took a bit longer than it's supposed to on Hiroku and then Hiroku kind of kills the process. She's like, okay, so there's another way around this, which is to use things like delayed jobs. Yeah. So, like delayed jobs, which basically you click it, you fire off something to do a queue and it runs it in the background somewhere. From a user perspective, it's like, wow, it's, it's already, already running. 
is it get responsive? The, the app feels more responsive, as in perception is more responsive. But actually, what it's doing is really firing off something in the background to, to trigger that job in the background. So, um, yeah, very simple optimization, but knowing where the bottleneck is helps a lot in, in, in designing your application. So if you all know Shopify, Shopify is also a Ruby on Rails app. They've been running on Rails for a long, long time. Even the CTO tweeted that, you know, Rails can scale because they are still on Rails. Okay, maybe one last question from the floor before I... Any other questions from the floor? Yes. How, how mature do you think of Rails, the Ruby ecosystem is, and what features of the language do you not like? What features of the language do you not like? And how mature is the ecosystem? Uh, so so I work on I occasionally I work on the Go stack in Grab Taxi also. So I actually when I compare it with the Rails ecosystem, I actually think the Rails ecosystem is much more mature. Um, like like just now Michael mentioned that Ruby's tooling is very very mature. Like all the Go guys still envy the Rails developers for the amount of metrics that you can get out of it for free. And then it's 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 been around so long that you can just see it that when you compare it to a new language like Go, a fairly new language like Go, you, you, the maturity is just there. And what feature I don't like about Ruby? I would say uh, the inclusive and non-inclusive dots. Like if it's two dots, it means one. It's, yeah, I don't even remember. The range, the range. Yeah, the range thing. Okay, okay. Okay, Sam? For me, um, I've always liked uh, uh, the concurrency languages very well. And, and uh, the way that Ruby does it, uh, concurrency, it's very similar to Python Twisted, uh, if there's any Python guys here. Uh, so, so um, kind of uh, hope that that will improve, where the VM understands that, hey, I need a thread and figures it out. You know, that I need more CPU power, I figure it out. Um, which is more efficient, uh, more like whole length. Uh, but otherwise, I, syntax-wise and feature-wise, I cannot complain. I think it's really very elegant uh, how it's done. The decisions uh, that the core team do is not lopsided to any area. Not performance, not syntax, not wow factors, not this, not that. They're very balanced, and, and, and which is why, which makes Rails even better, right? So I cannot really complain, yeah, about language here. Uh, ecosystem, I think, is relative. Uh, you know, on my perspective, it's more. Of is there enough of a, you know, not so much the language, right? It's more, is there enough of a community around this? Can you find developers? Can they get up to speed quickly? Can they start becoming productive with the language quickly? And I think that, to, to a large extent, is yes. Um, in terms of what I don't like with the language, I mean, nothing comes to mind. You know, the syntax, the thing is, uh, again, probably a different perspective. I see the language more as a tool to achieve some purpose, right? A business purpose, making the customer happy in a certain way. And when you look at it from that perspective, kind of syntax issues kind of melt away, right? That, that relatively easy ways to construct solutions around bad syntax or bad language features or whatever. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so there are, when you use Rails a lot, right, you find that there are some, there are some um, behaviors which are only specific to Rails and active support. That active support gives you, uh, like for example, a new class. Um, you can't use a present dot present on a new class outside of Rails. Yeah. You guys have to use a dot present mm -hmm. question mark. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So anyway, that's only in in Rails and only in active support that gives you that mm -hmm. kind of thing. You don't find it outside of, of, of Rails. So for somebody who's just working on Ruby on its own, I say maybe using Sinatra or something else that doesn't actually have. Active support sometimes is a bit of a gotcha, so that's that's my only kind of like fear. Like the the fear of using a framework like Rails is that you might get a vendor locked in. Like oh shit, I can't move out of this. Um, but so far, the decisions that the core team has made in, in terms of Rails and active support and other sort of things, I think it's been pretty good, and we are we went with them. And I think you follow the convention, you get things done very easily, and very quickly. Um, yeah, but it does give you a sense of lock-in as in you, if you move out of the comfort zone, you end up having to reinvent the wheel uh, fairly, a fair bit, a fair bit uh, in terms of stuff. Um, Ecosystem-wise, I think uh, as a PHP developer, I think the PHP community is also moving, trying to 
emulates the the real the Ruby community as well, like um, Bundler and having gems make it really easy to build. Uh, your dependency management is so easy in in, in Ruby and on Rails. Uh, with PHP, they've only recently gotten around to doing dependency management using something called Composer. Uh, so I think it's for them, for the PHP community, it's a kind of like we try our best. We try to we understand what TDD is, but we don't quite have the right tooling to get this thing done. Um, or other language itself may not just support the things that we could actually do uh, in, in Ruby right now. Um, so I mean, yeah. So I, I can only compare it from the PHP perspective because in I think Ruby the Ruby community is definitely more mature, uh, forward looking. And always, uh, and always, change, always pushing the boundaries in that sense. Um, PHP community is full, is somehow playing catch up, um, but I think there are some legacy issues which they, they had, the PHP community had to deal with. Um, like there's still, there's still people are using PHP four, so you know fragmentation. Fragmentation is uh, yeah hard to deal with. Um, I think one thing I really like about Ruby is that you can like create virtual environments. Uh, like you can run multiple versions of Ruby easily on, on, on your machine by right, using RBN for RBM. Um, in the PHP community, there's no accepted way of doing this right now. Uh, even Python is, is, uh, is also quite advanced in that sense. You also have your virtual environment, which makes it easy to, to create uh, virtual, uh, virtual environments where you have Python of a certain version running on your folder, um, which is also quite, quite cool. Um, yeah, PHP really doesn't actually have that. No, actually has that. It's okay, you don't have to keep bashing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, MVM version. Yeah. 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 does that very well. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah, ecosystem wise, I'll, I'll, I'll only comment that uh, the Node guys has uh, caught up mm. very quickly within a very short period of time. Uh, I'm not, I, I cannot really compare the two ecosystems as, as in how mature, mature, how big, how big, because they constantly change. Um, but close enough. Mm. Uh, What's interesting to note is that uh, Bundler and Jam wasn't the first packaging system around, right? Uh, the Java days, the guys has it as well, but but imp the implementation is very different, and 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 the uh, the um, the ecosystem didn't really think alike because mm -hmm. nobody forces them in one direction. So you have packages that kind of like conflict with other packages. Versioning didn't really work very well, and then you could have packages that you install and then it's there, but you can never include the class that never import the class. So, um, but I've never had that problem with uh, Ruby, as, you know, so long as uh, the, the gem is quite uh, decent, as in, um, that's code. Um, if it's a real gem, it normally from, uh, conforms to the convention, it forces itself in the right places. You can always require them, uh, whether is it copy script or is it uh, uh, Ruby classes. So, it's very different. And um, also, uh, I think uh, uh, because of Rails, because of Rails, um, Ruby Gem developers are uh, so called encouraged to to solve different problems in the MVC stack or in the MVC pattern. Right? They don't have to worry about a lot of things, right? Um, whereas, say in, in Node, if you then you, the first thing in Node you have to ask, am I an Express client or not an Express client, right? That's that's number one. That's already a kind of a, a, a put off sometimes. So what happens is that a lot of Node developers, uh, when we build NPMs, we build very specific NPMs that does one function very, very well, and that's it. Well trusted and not, it's good core and stuff, but um, uh, the number of huge uh, packages are far and few. Uh, that has its own advantages, uh, because it allows us to go really moderate, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but uh, so maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe to bring it back to the mm -hmm. question of about the, the maturity of the community to, to add on to, to what they have said so far. Um, I think the Ruby community is really you know doing well. Uh, what you should do is really go to the conferences. So <laughs> <laughs> this, this is one of them. <laughs> no, but at the same time, you can venture out to the conferences in other countries, especially go to Japan. So next year, they'll be doing it in Kyoto in September. If you can, go and visit uh, and talk to the people there, you know, get to know the community. They are all very friendly people. Um, go read Chion's blog post if you want to know why you should attend conferences. You can share the link. <laughs> and at the same time, I think uh, the Rails community is very open to, to helping people. Uh, they, they have been around for so many years. So I think uh, 
we all just want to play a part in making the community even better. Uh, what I don't like about Ruby, uh, I really can't think of anything. Maybe the new try syntax, right? Maybe that, but nothing else. Um, so, okay, so let me bring back the panel so that we can close it soon. Final question from me, all right? Mm, what do you think can be improved with the local Ruby community? What do you think needs to improve with the local Ruby community? I can stop first because I'm not I actually like hope that uh, during the, uh, the college days, the, the annual days or whichever you say, from, that uh, they also pick up Ruby mm -hmm. Yeah, and not wait until like they finish their degree, they, they graduate, and they were looking for a job, and they try to pick up whatever is out there. Mm -hmm. Because the schools normally teach them Java or .NET, mm -hmm. and that doesn't really really help uh, okay. in, a, in a way. Yeah, unless they're trying to look for a job in the bank. Right. Okay. Anything <laughs> else you all see that you feel needs to improve in the local Ruby community? Uh, so maybe what I would add is, um, so there's a lot, just like an incredible incredible amount of talent uh, locally and regionally. I think one thing that we can do better at is, and I say this as a Singaporean, you know, I grew up here, I was born here, is that um, the Asian mindset is to be less vocal and, you know, less out there, less public with stuff we've discovered, uh, less public about, um, you know, uh, talks to give. It's good that we have kind of conferences coming up. But I think if more people in the community just showed the rest of the world that, hey, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff, stuff, uh, cool stuff happening in Singapore and in Asia or Southeast Asia, you should come check it out. You know, that would go a massive way in terms of uh, making the community be, be seen in a better light internationally. Mm. Okay. Uh, for me, I, I, my general experience with real developers in Singapore and Malaysia is that they generally are, they are generally more quiet. They are not. They, they don't speak up enough. Like and the other thing is that I. I think I think being able to bring rails to like the college community, the high school community is very important because once you show them that there is something else other than .dot net, they'll be oh okay, there's another world out there. Okay. Michael. Uh, our a kind of like. I was was talking to. Um, in just now about there seems to be a chasm between people who are beginning rails mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people who are like intermediate or really make a decision to make it a career uh, doing that as in you see a lot of people attending like rails girls and all these other you know uh, beginners beginnerish kind of kind of things newish kind of kind of things like the uh, ruby tea party and all that stuff um, and how many of them actually progress on to become hired or go into this, do this as a career. Um, it's, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about. I think it's, it's, a concern, it's a concern across the board about Singaporeans or even uh, locals choosing to become an engineer rather than, or, uh, rather than going to work at a bank or something, right? So I think making, this, making a conscious choice to make this a career and to be good at it, um, become a craftsman in doing doing uh, in in software, being a software craftsman basically, um, yeah, and getting better at what you do. Mm -hmm. I think sharing sharing of knowledge of, of, of what, I think so far we've been really good at sharing knowledge. Uh, I think we should continue continue, continue to do that. Mm -hmm. I think sharing knowledge about best practices, things you have done, uh, and invent more, create more things, and share with us. Mm -hmm. I think it will be something exciting. To Okay. Yeah. okay, so I think that sort of sums up, you know, the mentality, the mind. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I would just like to mention that the I live in the United States and the way I found out about you guys is by Googling and seeing the, the video that you had posted. So I've seen Winston and watched the video <laughs> a couple of months before he was coming to Singapore. Uh, if you'd like the world to know more about what you're doing, make more videos. Okay. So, yeah, so, uh, so thank you to Michael for, for doing all of the hard work in translating all these videos. I think he and his team are doing a great job in pushing out, you know, our community to the outside world. So thank you so much to him and his team. Am I looking for volunteers? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. But I guess uh, across the board, you know, we hope that everyone can speak up more, participate in the meetups more, so that we have more talks scheduled for everyone to learn from one another. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed the session today. If you have more questions, feel free to approach them individually. Some of them are hiring, right? So talk to them. See if you can get you know your job today. <laughs> <laughs> Interview that there are rooms to do in the room. <laughs> Alright, if not, can we give uh, another round of applause to our candidates? <laughs> so, thank you so much to them, and again, thank you to our sponsors today, Tinker Box, Referral Candy, Hire.com. Uh, feel free to stay around. Is that still food? I don't know. Yeah, that's still food, right? So, please continue to stay around, uh, have food, mingle around, talk to each other, say Merry Christmas. Alright? Thank you so much for coming. Merry Christmas. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank